If you have your Bible, open it to Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to start a, a four-sermon series starting today. It's one of uh, the five things in our church that we say these are the principles and the precepts that we're going to go by. These are the things that we're going to highlight that are important to us as the, the life of the church, and that is discipleship. Discipleship. We talk a lot about worship. We try to define worship. We talk about evangelism. Highly, highly important. We need to serve, amen? We need to have fellowship. But if we're not discipling, we're not fulfilling the commission that God's given us to do. The last words that he said should be our first words. If, he, if you had one last conversation to have with someone, you would want them to remember it. And it's been recorded for us. It's, it's very plain. It's very simple. Matter of fact, it's preached on all the time it, it, to the point that, that we are to the place that we are so, I'm going to say it, sermon deaf. We've, oh, I've heard that. It, when I said Matthew 28, some of y'all immediately said, oh, we got the Great Commission today. I, I know that one. I got that. Well, I think in heaven, God's looking down, and, and He can see our lives exactly as they are. And, and not in our talk, but in our walk, He's going to see how much of us have gotten it. As a matter of fact, I think this is one of those things that the longer I've been a Christian, the more I've been drawn to it. The more I've understood the need for it. I've got a group of men that I meet with, just men. Ladies aren't invited. Ha, ha, ha. And we talk, and we talk about anything. And, and somebody says, well, what part of Scripture? I really don't care where in Scripture we study because it's all good. Amen? From Genesis to Revelation, it is good. And you can learn from it, and you can grow from it. But what I have learned in my own life, how much I need that group, how much I need it. I told you all a few weeks ago, um, one of, my, one of my five closest friends passed away 48 years ago, 48 years old. And, and I, was, I was devastated. And, and we're, who were the first ones that I called that group? And they were there for me. And I'm grateful for that. I need that. The thing is, is that all of us need that. Though we like to be the lone wolf, wolf that wants to just go in our own way. Stand up with me in honor of reading God's Word. Matthew 28, verse number 16. Give me, give Kale a, I told him verse 18, but let me give him a second to back it up. All right, let's go. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. Why is it 11? Judas is not here. They went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. Amen? If Christ were to walk in here, he would have our 100% attention, right? Everything else would go away, where we're going to eat lunch and all that kind of stuff. None of that would matter. We would get directly to him and we would give him praise and honor and glory. Amen? They worshiped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. How can you be in the presence of God and still have part of your life that's worrying and fretting? Why, why is it that, that, that we know God's got this? He is the God of the universe. He has all power. He gives all love. He has all wisdom. He, he supplies every need that we could ever think that we have. But yet when we face it, we're like, I don't know. I don't know. But every Christian is there. Verse 18, Jesus' words. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Matthew begin, ends it with these words. Amen. It is true. So be it. Let's pray. Father, you are God and we know it. You are worthy of our worship and our praise. No matter our circumstances, we honor you. Lord, uh, you are the object of our faith and our love and our trust. We are nothing without you. But Lord, we have all things because of you. Thank you for loving us in such a way. Lord, there's probably some people here who do not know you yet as Savior and Lord. And if that is the case, Holy Spirit, speak to them, draw them, reveal yourself to them, reveal their sin that se separates them from you. Lord, it would honor you, I know, but we would be so honored too if you would save that person today. But Lord, for those that have come to accept you as Savior and Lord and have repented and have asked you to bless their life and now we seek to be followers of you. Teach us what that means for us today to follow you in spirit and in truth. Father, I pray for the next few moments. May this be a God moment. Lord, Holy Spirit, speak to us as only you can. Draw us close I pray that we would be open to any change, any miracle, any manifestation that you so seek to do in our life. Because Lord, if it's you, it's good for us and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. You know, everything begins and ends with God. In the beginning, God was there in the heavens. There was no equal to him, as there never will be. And yet, even there, he desired to bless. So he had a creation. We know them as there were the cherubim, there were the seraphims, the archangels, and the angels of God. And they were there in the presence of God. And because God created them, a perfect God can only do one thing. He creates everything perfectly. And they were there in fellowship. Everything God had given them, they gave back unto him to give him honor and glory and praise. And that was, there was no clock ticking. So as we would define it today, we don't know how long that went on. But then there was a day there was a time, I should say. There was an event that happened. There was one named Lucifer. You know all of his nicknames that describe who he was. The Bible tells us that he was created by God, that he was a cherubim, and that he was full of wisdom and beauty. He was one of God's greatest, well, they were all great, but he was given access to be in the very presence of God. He was the guarding cherubim who covers. That's the old King James word. He, had, he, he And he honored God by, by fulfilling what he was created to do. But somewhere in there, he said, in, in looking at the perfection and the goodness of God, he said, I could do that. I desire to be like that. Now, all of us would desire to be like God but we know that we're not. And yet he, in that sense, said, I can be like God. I want my throne to be equal with his. And then we know the story. How dare he lift himself up like that? Because literally it was his pride that put himself on the same level as God. We've never, no one has ever been able to do that. Only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? That would have been a really good place to shout amen. That's true, so be it. We're not there. But his sin 
of saying that I can be like God. I want to be like God. I'm on the same level of God. It was sin for him. And one third of the angels in glory felt the same way and followed him. And God created the earth. And he put man on earth. And he created them perfect. And there they were, living for the glory of God. Everything God had given them, they enjoyed, but they gave him praise and glory and honor in that. Could you imagine fully recognizing, yielding, blessing God for all the goodness that he's given to you? And once again, sin had not occurred, so the clock wasn't ticking. We don't know how long that happened. But one day Satan came in and he tempted them with the same thing that had, was in on his heart. You can be like God. And they fell for it. And when they fell for it, sin came into their life. Now there's a dilemma. And we're still living that dilemma today. How do we live successfully separated from God? You get your very breath by God's grace. There is a common grace that's out there that all of us enjoy together. And the clock is ticking on us. And we have this thing called time. So how are we going to live our life? Our goal for God is this. This is how mankind looks at it. We, we approach God with what I call a blended approach of obedience and disobedience. Of belief and unbelief. Of faith and a lack of faith. And it all depends upon us in our circumstance and how we react to it. We come to it, we say, you know what? I've got all these things and God's been so good to me and, 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 and I just give him praise and honor and glory. And other things come to us and we just say, no, 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 that's about me. I want to do what I want to do. And we walk through life kind, kind of saying, this part of our life we're going to give to God. But this other part of our life we're going to hold back. Now, at this point in time, if you're trying to fade me out, you're going to miss it. Because what I just said is every one of us, every one of us, within us, God has given, God has, by the power of His Spirit, revealed in every one of us that there is a God. And we know that. All over the world, people are, are looking to something and calling it God, even if it's themselves. And they're going to yield part of that to God, but they're going to hold part of it back to themselves. How are we going to live this blended approach? We really receive what we like about God, and we reject what we're not comfortable with about the will of God in our life. So God gave us commandments. Now, the commandments were never to make us righteous before God because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Y'all got it? Amen. How many of us? All. All means all, and that's all all means, right? We got any perfect people in here? You know, I usually expect to see one hand. No perfect people allowed inside, right? Just us sinners allowed in here. Amen? And, and praise God that God gives us forgiveness. If you come to Jesus Christ, if you trust in Him, if you know that what He can do, praise God, He will bless us with forgiveness so that we can have a relationship with Him. The commandments were there for us to show us our sin so that we know that we're sinners, so that we can come to God. But they do not make us righteous. So what did God do? He sent His Son, His perfect Son, to be our Redeemer, to be our Savior. The perfect one who came, I'm not going to go, I, man, I could preach for an hour on just Jesus, amen? But he, he came to give His life, yield His life. He served us. 
He put us above himself. He came to give what we could not give, to pay for what we could not pay. So what we, we could receive what we do not deserve and we could have a relationship with the Almighty. He bridged the gap. And for those of us that are wise enough, we received it. He went to the cross. He paid the price. He was buried. Satan thought he had him sealed. But resurrection Sunday morning, everything changed. He came to give life forevermore. And those of us who received Jesus Christ, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We're in the hand of God. Satan can't get to us. He holds us with his everlasting love. We're good forevermore. And yet, come on, we live a blended life. Even then, if we're wise enough to receive his salvation, there are parts of our life, oh, I pray, Holy Spirit, speak, that we will yield to him. And there are other parts of life where we're not comfortable and we're going to take control of those areas. We're not going to obey. We're going to have some form of disobedience. Some days more obedience than others. Some days more disobedience than others. Is that correct? We're not perfect. We're just forgiven. But if we're forgiven and Jesus was resurrected and he came to give us life, that means that we have the resurrected life of Christ. And we need to live that resurrected life, that not perfect life, but forgiven life. And here's the word, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I got everything I needed 51 years ago when I walked an aisle on a Sunday night and bowed my heart to God and cried out to him, and I felt like I was going to explode because of my sin, but yet he met me there, and he took all that burden away. I went down with tears. I stood up with a smile. I had excitement. I, I felt... <clears throat> Do y'all know my, what I mean when I say the word relief? There was joy, there was love, there was peace. There was goodness, but it was so opposite of what I had before. Praise God for that. He makes a difference. Amen? We should worship Him because of that. Amen? Now, as you know, I'm not perfect. But I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I almost looked back at, their, at you, Jack. Just, I told him, I said, he said, I'm going to the back row. I said, well, amen, it's good from the back row. <laughs> Y'all, the rest of y'all missed a good opportunity. Y'all could have shouted the clouds down with that one. Praise God, I'm not perfect. And, and though some of you may think I am. No, none of y'all think I am. I'm better than I was. And I've walked through a lot of circumstances. And I've faced some hardships. Anybody in here failed? Do, do you beat yourself up? Do you look back on it and say, how big of an idiot I was? It's almost like we look at those things with dread, but then I understand that those are things that we grow from and we learn from. Praise God from growing and learning. And though I'm not there yet, I'm on my way. And I may not be what I need to be, but I'm better than I used to be. So every day I'm learning what it means to be in Christ, the hope of glory. Now, listen to Jesus' last words. The first thing he says in verse 18 is, all authority has been given to me. <clears throat> he is the conquering Savior. And I don't need to define that word authority. Lucifer thought he was the same as God. Jesus is saying, you're not. We are not. 
Though we walk through life with this blended obedience, obedient in certain things, disobedient in others, Jesus is making this plain and clear. He's the only one, and he is saying, I've settled it. It's done. All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth, and we can say forevermore. Now, based upon that, with knowing that, understanding that, and believing that, he says something else to us. Go, therefore, for the rest of your days, church, I don't know how many days you have, and you don't get to retire from God's presence or His service or His love, come on, or His joy or His peace or His goodness or His kindness. You may not be as kind as you need to be, but He wants to place His kindness within you. So He says, go therefore and make disciples. That is a command. Literally what he is saying is, as you go, make disciples. When we say amen in this building and we leave and we start to continue to live our life, as you go, make disciples. Now, understanding God does the work, but he has graciously let us be a part of it so we can be a part of what this means in making disciples. He's the one that does the saving, amen? He's the one who grows us, amen? But we get to be a part of it. If you're looking say, oh, God made me into this, but you don't think other people can come in and be a part of this process, you're missing it. All right, let's, let's, let's get real down to brass tacks here. Y'all with me? People get saved. People come to church because they want to come to church. They take their Bible every day, read their Bible every day. Amen? Pray. Probably don't read it as much as you should, do you? But you read it. Probably don't pray as much as you should, but you pray. Billy Graham was asked at the end of his life when he was in his 90s, what would you do differently? He said, I would read my Bible more, I would pray more. I figure if Billy Graham, the great Billy Graham, who had the anointing of God, if he says I should pray more and if I should read my Bible more, that probably says a lot about me too. Does that say a lot about you? We do that. And then we walk through our life and, and we do our thing and we mess up. And praise God, the Holy Spirit lives within us and he speaks to us. Y'all good with that? That's good. You have a personal, personal relationship with a holy God. He, that's that part of it when he said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm there with you. I live within you. You hear my whisper. And you say, that's all I need. Well, then you're calling Jesus a liar. Because he says, other people need to come along beside you and help disciple you. A disciple is first taught. And you have the Holy Spirit with you. And you read the Word of God. And you pray. And the Holy Spirit takes you into the very presence of heaven. But he says the magic happens when you live with the church. You live with the community. You live with other people. So I open my Bible and I read this and I say, hey, this is really good. Then I've got other people that I invite into my life. And when we say, hey, you know, I was reading the Bible and it says, and someone else will say, you know, this is what that means to me. And what happens is, have y'all ever heard this scripture in the Old Testament, iron sharpens iron? The Holy Spirit does something in community. A mentor is what every one of us needs. A disciple must first be taught. 
if I wanted to go learn to weld, you know, and I went and bought a welder, you know, and, and, and I grabbed all the stuff with it and I kind of tried to figure it out. I would be blind probably within 30 minutes. Matter of fact, I probably would burn down everything around me. No, not 30 minutes. It'd probably take me an hour to burn everything down. But if I had someone beside me that was walking beside me, it'd be a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? And yet that's the very thing that Lucifer felt in his heart. He didn't need God. He didn't need anyone else. Eve wanted to be like God. She wanted to be independent of God. I don't need that. We live with this blended disobedience. And Jesus is saying the greatest thing that can happen to you is understanding that you must live your life being taught. So you come and hear me preach. Y'all want to hear this statistic? It doesn't matter who the preacher is. That gives me great freedom. You're not going to retain any more than 3% of my sermon. Now don't say, well, then just preach for three minutes. Because I don't know what three minutes you're going to get. Amen? But when you get with a group of people and you start not only talking about it, but discussing it, where everybody is bringing their thoughts into it, the the retention level goes from 3% to, are you ready for this? 40. Now, so that tells me that if you have your time with the Holy Spirit, and, and, and your Bible, and, and, and you're there, and, the, and praise God, God's there. You're going to get some good stuff. Now, what I have learned is I take a notebook with me, and I write it down. Adrian Rogers said, the worst ink is better than the best mine. Because you can go back to it five minutes later and say, oh, that's what it said. But if I don't, with my mind, I'll go back five minutes later and go, what was it I said? You know, that thought that you got, that pearl from from God, and you said, I'll never forget that as long as I live. That's so wonderful. Five minutes. It's gone. So you know what I do? I write it down. I write it down. And then when a group of us get together and we talk about it, and we the practical application in our life begins to happen. Now, if I'm talking to a big group, you'll get a little bit. If you get into a smaller group, you'll get more. You'll get 20%. But if you get where you are actually conversing, that's when it gets to 40%. I wish it were 100, but we're not there yet. But I like 40 a whole lot better than I like 3 And here's the thing. This is Jesus' approach. One of the very first books that I read when I was 24 years old was The Master's Plan for Evangelism. I mean, we, we had it in seminary too. It was wonderful. It's so easy. And, and Jesus said, I've got 12 disciples I'm going to pour myself into. Every night he would be around in, in small groups in homes, probably Maybe six people, maybe four people. You know, if it were us, we'd be saying, let's get the biggest building we could get and we'll get amplification and we'll get, we'll get all these people and let Jesus preach to all these people. Well, he had big crowds, but not as often as you may think. But every day he was with a group of people. And even if it was the 12, And really, when you study it, you'll find that even the 12 was divided up into four groups of three. And the reason I think that is, is they were walking everywhere, and and Jesus wouldn't hang out with the same two or three. He would go around different ones and be talking to them. Wouldn't it be cool to just walk through the day and talk to Jesus about different stuff? Hey, Jesus, look over there. Look at them idiots over there. What, What do you think about that? You know? And he could say, Well, I didn't create them that way. They chose to be that way. You could have conversations. But here's the magic. 
is what happened in those conversations. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Does anybody ever wonder why there was three in one, but one is three? Uh, by the way, I can't define the Trinity. I've tried. I don't even like my definition. But he teaches us in groups. It's the essence of who he is. So we have all these church members, <clears throat> and we say, we would like to you to be in a small group. I don't care if you do it on Sunday morning at Sunday school time. I'm fine with that. I don't care if you do it on Tuesday afternoon or Monday night or Thursday morning. But wouldn't it be good if you had a group of people that you could be honest with and you could talk about issues with and we could encourage each other and we could live in community and love each other? Wouldn't it be good to know that there are some people in this world that always have your back? <clears throat> Personally, I don't want to live the rest of my life that, without it. I need it. And if you don't think you need it, you're missing out on the commandments of God. Go make disciples of all the nations. Nobody is excluded. We're going to talk about this for a month. But really, it comes to the point in time now is, in my walk with God, would I be better if I open myself up and let other people into a group where I could encourage them, they could encourage me. I can bring what they need. They can bring what I need. Nobody's got it all together. All the great preachers of the past, they, they, they didn't know the whole Bible. Spurgeon was awesome in Psalms. Man, his book on Psalms is like fire. It is, God lit that man up in the Psalms. An Old Testament book. Somebody else may be good in, in, in the Gospels. Somebody else may be good in, in faith. Somebody else may be good in trust. So if you get those group of people, I may be down here today, but somebody else may be there. And then what you'll find is, is as you become like, when I, when I am before God, I'm naked before Him. But if you allow that transparency to happen among others, God will bless he will encourage. This is what you will do. You'll say, well, I'm not letting anybody else into my life that way. No siree. I'm not going to make my life transparent. And you will live your life alone. The last thing he told his disciples as they were going to go out in a mission to bless the world with the power of God was go together and make mentor disciples. When Jesus would be walking around, even when he went to the uh, disciples, the apostles, what did he say to them? Follow me. And they followed Jesus together and if we would be wise, we would learn to follow together as well.